Don't Starve Together. There's a very good chance you've already heard of this game. With it always going on sale, always being updated, and its simple but complex gameplay lies a solid reason why this game is still rated overwhelmingly positive on Steam despite its age. It's procedurally generated, not that difficult to run, and most of all, it has a friendly and recognizable hand-drawn to the art style that just oozes charm and appeal. Which begs the question, how difficult is it really to don't starve? <laughs> Very hard! I swear to god, don't be fooled by this game's cutesy appeal and grim aesthetic as behind its charming good looks and innocent design hides some monstrous survival game that will eat you alive and spit out your bones. Sometimes, literally. Come on, everyone, I'm Ellie Manapi, and today we're going to survive. Don't starve together. Try not to burn down your base. Oh shit. Uh, uh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, 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 god damn it. Well, that's not good. Don't Starve Together is a co op survival game wherein you and your friends survive through exploration, crafting, and occasional combat. It's you against the world. And when I say you against the world, I really do mean you against the world, as no other survival game holds this statement is true as Don't Starve Together. Don't Starve Together's world is as alive as the characters you play, from the very trees you chop during the day to the shadows that appear during the night. Now, because of the game's ability to surprise and confuse new players, the game has an understandable reputation on making new players tend to quit, mostly because they have no idea what they're doing. They just die. In fact, here are the things new players tend to die from and don't starve together. Hunger, sanity loss, getting lost in general, getting attacked by bullfrogs, getting attacked by spiders, getting attacked by pigs as you run away from said spider, not having a light source at night, getting too much light source at night, meeting Charlie for the first time, and my personal favorite, absolutely nothing. It must have been very interesting, you just minding your own business, nearly thinking that you've managed to get the gist of the game, and then... <coughs> what? This beginner's guide revolves around 8 things. World creation, survivors, user interface, exploration, gathering, crafting, base building, and finally, seasons. Don't Starve Together is not as complicated as you think it is. I love this game, and I'll do my very best to keep this as concise as possible, helpful as possible, while keeping most, if not all of this game's unexpected surprises. Because they have a lot. That is not a good sound. What is that? It's red. Hello? Oh. oh hello? Oh god. Much like other survival games, Don't Starve Together starts with you creating a randomized pre-generated world, which means it'll be different every time you start a new game. There are five game modes in Don't Starve Together. Relaxed, Survival, Wilderness, Endless, and Lights Out. Now, technically speaking, survival is the default experience in Don't Starve Together, but I highly, highly recommend playing this game on Endless as it's mostly the same as survival except it has unlimited respawns upon that. But if you've been doing that for quite a while and you're still having a difficult time, then play the game on Relax, which is, again, the same as Endless except everything toned down. This includes how often you get hungry, insane, cold, and warm. While Wilderness and Lights Out can be fun, these are mostly for players who are already experienced with the game, with Wilderness randomly spawning you in the world as a different character each death, and Lights Out essentially being a permanent night mode. Have everything set to default, name your world, set a password, and you're all set. Now, I just want to say this right off the bat, the goal for this video is not to be amazing and don't starve together. I ain't gonna teach you how to do everything, I'm not gonna tell you how you should play your game, and I'm not gonna teach you how to defeat any of the bosses. It's just gonna ruin your experience 
and survival games are best played with you learning and experiencing this stuff on your own. What I am gonna teach you is how to survive. Survive long enough so you can actually enjoy the game and not die as much. Cause there's a very good chance that the whole reason you searched this video in the first place is not because you want to get good, but because you've probably died way too many times and you have no idea how to stop it. And that's fine. Okay, where can I place this? Oh! Oh, I forgot to eat. Yeah, that seems about right. Now, as of writing this video, there are 23 survivors in Don't Starve Together, all of them having their own strengths and weaknesses. Base Instinct will tell you to play as Wilson, as he is the mascot of the game. So he should give you the most vanilla experience. And you're mostly right. But with all the updates that this game has gone through, no character is longer classified as the default or vanilla character. Every character now has his or her own advantages and disadvantages. Woody has his own indestructible axe. Willow has her ladder. Walter has his trusty companion. And Warley can create her useful contraptions. But the absolute best character that I advise you to pick if you really want to have an easier time, at least in the first in-game year, would be Wendy. Wendy excels in a lot of things. Supply gathering, survival from hound attacks, has a built-in light source when darkness comes, and by god is she cute. My reasoning as to why she's such a good character to start off with, especially for new players, is because of this. This is Abigail, and she will be your best friend throughout the game. Technically, she's your, uh... And to be honest, with her by your side, this game just becomes easy mode. Mostly. Obviously, you can still use other survivors if you wish, so if you really, really don't want to play as Wendy, here are the top survivors I'd recommend, especially for new players. Avoid these ones as they change up the gameplay too much, and these ones are good too, except they require you to have some knowledge of how the game works to have their benefits shine. So, yeah. But rest assured, every character is unique, and every character is fun to play as. It's just I really recommend playing as these ones as they are the most beginner friendly. If you want to learn more about survivors, I'll leave it in the tips and tricks section of this video. No. God, what is going on? Ah! I need to get out of here. Once you enter the world, you will be bombarded by a bunch of things that could confuse you. It's an exciting world, and if you played other survival games before, chances are you will encounter some familiar mechanics as well as not so familiar ones. I'm not gonna make this super complicated, you really only have to worry about 5 things. First is your health. You know what health is, the more you lose, the closer you are to that. Kinda like real life, very self-explanatory don't get hit by enemies. You're gonna die. Second is your sanity. Sanity goes down naturally and the best way to have it replenished is for you to sleep. Sleep actually refreshes both your health and sanity. And once you receive the option to sleep, the rest of the game will start to become less of a hassle. Third is hunger. Again, it goes down naturally and you can remedy this by eating. If you didn't know that, I don't know what to tell you. There are a lot of things you can eat and don't starve together, but that doesn't mean you should eat them. You can experiment with that in your free time. If it looks like it's fit for consumption, chances are it is. If it affected you in a negative way, maybe don't do that again. If you go up that, you should be able to see a clock that somewhat shows you the time of day. Yellow is day, red is dusk, and blue is that. Just kidding, it's night, actually, which is kinda like that, especially if you stay in darkness for too long. Certain things will happen depending on what time of day it is, don't worry about that too much. For now, just know that darkness is bad. So try your best to always have a light source at the ready. You don't want to run out of that when the time you need it the most. On the left side of the screen, you will see your crafting bar. 
there should already be pre-assigned hotkeys on the crafting bar itself, but if it doesn't have any, you can customize that later on. You can click on the topmost button in the menu to open up all of your options. Do this and you'll see everything you can craft, everything you will need, and everything you will need to craft before you can build. Now, with that out of the way, you might be asking yourself, what exactly is the goal of Don't Starve Together? The obvious answer is to not starve. But what else? The answer is whatever you like. Don't Starve Together is a sandbox of opportunities for which you can do just about anything. Explore the randomized cave systems like the forest, build your own farm like Stardew Valley, build the base of your dreams like Terraria, or you can do what most people do, which is to defeat all 20-ish bosses and don't starve together. Kinda like Dark Souls. You didn't expect that in a survival game, huh? This will take a while as it's very much replayable due to the multiple survivors you can play as. Each survivor in the game plays differently from one another, with each world creation being randomized and pre-generated every time. The replayability is just about limitless. Even more so since the modding community in this game is incredibly active. Huh. Oh my god! Okay, you've created a world, you've decided on a character, and I told you how Don't Starve Together works and what players usually do. Let's talk about actually playing the game, starting with exploration. Do not pick up everything you see. As tempting as it looks, that's an easy way to fill up your inventory with things you don't even know if you need. While exploring, here are the things I'd recommend you take instead. Grass, sticks, flint, rocks, logs, gold, but not too much, and a lot of flowers. I'll tell you why later. If you have space for other things, you can go ahead and pick them up if you wish. Nothing wrong with being curious unless it looks like this. Exploring will take a while. In fact, if you want to explore all of the edges of the map, that will take about 5 in-game days at the very least. Really, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Most players actually tend to build their base upon spawn. There's nothing wrong with that. I personally just like to explore the whole map first. As you explore the whole map, the more information you'd receive on where the supplies would be, the cave entrances, the potential enemy spawns, as well as where certain biomes would be located. Some build their base next to bees, some build next to spiders, some build on the desert biome itself, and some would like to build at the spawn. Again, it's completely up to you. I guess my only advice is, maybe don't explore the caves just yet. Trust me on this, you're not ready for that. Heck, I wasn't ready for that. Oh, rabbits. Huh. I think I can create a farm here. Are they hostile? Okay, they are. Nothing's ever friendly in this game, huh? Despite how old and confusing this game can be sometimes, the crafting menu in this game has actually, and recently, been updated to be much more useful and much more beginner-friendly. Crafting used to be a pain, having to scroll up and down multiple tabs just to get what you want, but now you have this wide selection of options of which you can pick and choose. You've always had that before, but now they made it far better. You can experiment, explore, and do what you want, but you'd probably need these four things the most. An axe for chopping trees, a pickaxe for mining stone, a torch for light and burning, and a fire pit for cooking. Also for light and burning. Now, get familiar with crafting as early as possible as there will be moments where you'd need to quickly craft something because time is short. Thankfully, much like the forest, the crafting system in this game is so simple that really all you need to do is to pick whatever you want to craft, check what it needs, get them, and then build it. It's actually very much like the forest, how about that? You can craft these items easily with logs, sticks, flint, stone, and grass. These five are the base essentials for crafting any item. Well, maybe not every item, but most of the structures and tools at the very beginning, and even at the somewhat far end of the game. You'll need them to build tents, crockpots, fire pits, 
utensils, backpacks, chests, weapons, armors, tools, and even the science machine and alchemy engine, allowing you to unlock, build, and craft more things. Grass and sticks can be found easily, flint and rocks can be gathered from boulders, and logs can be chopped from trees. Personally, and this is just me, in the first five days, as I've said, I don't even build a base. I just explore and gather materials. Bases can be built almost instantly, and if you don't have the materials, it's just gonna be you going in and out of your base just to get them. That's just my advice. It's your game. Do what you want. Pick a flower for the fire. Ow! Oh, shit! I just wanna pick flowers, man. If you want to survive your first days in Don't Starve Together and have an easier time as soon as possible, this is what I'd recommend you build. It'll help deal with all of your early in-game problems and technically speaking, it's actually enough to keep yourself alive assuming that everything goes well. But knowing this game, it probably won't. These three things should be easy enough to build as you would already have all the materials necessary when you were exploring. These four, however, not as much, but the materials should be easy enough to get. First things first is a tent. A tent would require silk. Those look like spider webs and as you would have guessed, they come from spiders and spider dens. An easy way to grab some and not get hurt in the process is to craft a spear and kill them one by one. But that can be dangerous, especially if you're new to the game. So instead, what I'd recommend you do is to go and build traps. Place them near dens, lure them out, bait them there, and there you go. You've now successfully gained a spider. Commit the... Uh, and it'll either give you monster meat, spider glands, or silk. Let's hope that it's silk. I mean, you can always grab some more if it doesn't give you one. Now, if you're playing as Wendy, you don't even have to build anything. Oh, they're attacking. Yeah, Abigail's got this. Well, that was easy. Abigail is strong enough to kill multiple spiders, bees, frogs, hounds, and even tank a tall bird long enough for you to strike the killing blow. Just make sure you stay at a safe distance, get too far, and it'll ignore the enemy and follow you instead. Tents allow you to sleep, regenerating health and sanity at the cost of hunger. Do not sleep when you're hungry. You're gonna die. Next is the ice box. Ice boxes work much like refrigerators, slowing down the spoiling of food. Chances are the flowers that you've picked up a while ago have now spoiled and are now rot. Don't Starve Together has a spoilage system. Every single edible food can spoil, and given enough time, they will no longer replenish hunger and will damage you instead. And while it's fine to have flowers spoiled, you really don't want to have the same thing happen to food as that is more precious. The game is called Don't Starve Together after all. Now, you can build an ice box with basic materials, but this time, you will need gears as opposed to silk. Gears can be dropped by chest pieces, which are a bit more complicated to kill. You can't use the same trap mechanic you used on spiders, and this time, you really will have to fight and defeat an enemy to get what you need. So suit up, weapon up, and do your best. As difficult as that sounds, night pieces are not as difficult as you think. You can kill them by hitting them twice, dodging once, hitting them twice again, rinse, and repeat. There are two other types of chess pieces, which is the bishop and the rook. The bishop has a long-range attack, which is very annoying, so I just tend to avoid those entirely, while the rook will just downright destroy you. So, don't even bother. Again, if you play this Wendy, this will be much easier as she will tank most of the damage and do most of the work. Just make sure you help out a little bit. Abigail is not invulnerable. Next on the list is a crockpot, and for that, you would need charcoal. This one is a whole lot easier to acquire, and thankfully, you won't even need to kill enemies. Just bring out a torch, find some trees, and Burn. As you would have thought, trees will catch on fire. Turn black, chop it, and there you go. Charcoal. That's not how it works in real life. Don't do that at home. But much like real life, fire does in fact spread. 
quite rapidly in fact. So try to pick ones that are separate from the rest. Burn them and you're all set. Charcoal acquired. Now that you can cook and store food, the only thing left to worry about would be to produce the food itself. Now, there are actually two ways for which you can build a sustainable garden. What I'll teach you is the easiest and simplest one. All you would need is this. Actually, a bunch of this. Craft a shovel, go around, dig out a bunch of berry bushes, and replant them near your base. Fertilize them using the rot you acquired from the flowers you collected, and there you go, a sustainable garden. They should grow and provide you berries before winter comes in about 3-5 to five days. Manure and guano does work in terms of fertilization, but that takes a while and rot is just much more easier to acquire. And with that, now you have a science machine and an alchemy engine for unlocking blueprints, a fire pit to produce light, a tent for you to sleep in, a garden to produce food, an ice box to keep food fresh, and a crock pot to cook food on. And with that, you're all set. Congratulations! You now have everything you need to simply don't starve together. And I mean that. You can explore if you want, grab more supplies if you wish, and really, if you want to end this video and play the game, you could. Or you could also keep watching as Don't Starve Together is an amazing game filled with things to do, a world that continuously evolves, and lore that is absolutely filled to the brim with charm and style albeit from the characters you play to its hidden story. And as promised, here are all the tips and tricks I've learned, gathered, thought of, and found online. The best way to start this game is to play it in endless mode, with the world set to its default values. It's very much balanced and it's only really going to challenge you come spring and especially summer. Another option is to play the game on relax as this will lessen the tick rate for most counters in the game, such as hunger and sanity, while at the same time making you invulnerable from dying from them. You can still die from enemies though, so keep that in mind. Summer tends to be a pain for most players especially because of wildfires. I myself am okay with it as you can easily stop them with ice phlegomatics, but you can turn that setting off entirely during world creation, which I highly suggest. Made a mistake? That's okay, you can roll back to a previous save up to 5 prior days. It'll only go back up to 5 days, so if you want to keep that save point safe, just copy and back it up instead. As you've noticed from this playthrough, it's a bit different as opposed to yours. That's because I've been playing this game with mods. Don't worry, it's nothing groundbreaking or game-changing, just enough to give me some more information. I advise you do the same as I've only had 3 mods active during this entire playthrough. One being extremely helpful for most players, with the other two being there for aesthetic purposes. Status HUD is a user interface mod that reinvents the status icons in the upper right corner of the screen, allowing you to see the number of days for each season, the temperature, your wetness, mm, along with the actual numbers regarding your hunger, sanity, and health. Most if not all players actually use this mod when they play the game, and in fact, it's so useful that I'm surprised that the base game still doesn't have this. The two other mods I have installed is Geometric Placements and Snapping Tills. They make base building look cleaner and very much aligned to a grid. Again, you don't really need any of this. Two of these mods are just for alignment purposes, with the other one just for extra information. If you'd like to install them, you can do so through the Steam Workshop. I'll also leave my own personal mod list whenever I create a new world, as well as the reason as to why I play them. It's a very vanilla-centric mod list focused on quality of life changes, aesthetic choices, and expanded characters. You'll find them in the description below. The characters in Don't Starve Together survive mostly in the same manner, albeit through different ways and through different gameplays. Now, each one has their own strengths and weaknesses, and even though I did suggest Wendy to be your first character, as a beginner's guide, I'll still give you some basic information for each survivor, what they do, and how their gameplay will be different from others. With that said, Let's start with the game's mascot. Wilson the Gentleman Scientist is Don't Starve Together's official mascot. His gameplay is simple enough and he should give you the most basic experience as opposed to the other characters on this list. He did get a rework a bunch of times already and now has been involved in the introduction of a new skill tree system. 
Yet even with this new introduction to the skill tree system, he is as vanilla as the character could be. UB friendliness, 4 out of 5. Willow, the far starter, is one of the easiest characters to start the game with due to her unique lighter. This one can be used for just about anything from burning things, cooking things, as well as being your own personal light source in the dark despite how small the radius can be. What also makes her amazing is that 1. She has a much higher temperature resistance in regards to heat. 2. She actually gains sanity from heat itself. And 3. In the off chance that her sanity does go down drastically, you can easily get it back up with her teddy bear, Bernie, able to defend you from shadow creatures as soon as they spawn. UB friendliness, 5 out of 5. Wolfgang the Strongman is also a great character to start your game with, with his gameplay revolving around building up, well, strength through training and exercise. Wolfgang starts off with below average stats, all while having one of the most pumped up damage later on. He's also a great character to start off with, mostly because his quirks are directly related on how the game generally works. That means, as long as you're doing a great job with the game, chances are you're doing an even better job as Wolfgang. Just make sure you're keeping Wolfgang strong. He is the strong man after all. You be friendliness. 5 out of 5. Wendy the Bereave is, as I've said, is my suggested just judge what am I saying? Is my suggested character when it comes to starting your Don't Starve Together journey in terms of easy survival. And while her basic stats might be mediocre and sometimes just downright bad, what really sets her apart is her beloved sister Abigail, able to turn this newbie nightmare of a game into one of the most smoothest experiences ever in comparison to the other characters in this list. Again, for new players, if you're really not sure what to pick, pick Wendy. You'll be glad that you did. You be friendliness, Abigail out of 5. WX78 the Soulless Automaton can be a bit tricky. What's actually great about him is that he's not very opposed to eating rotten or nearly spoiled food. He negates all sanity drops in relation to food consumption, and he only sees food in relation to the hunger it replenishes and the health it provides. WX78 is built, literally, to be the most versatile character in Don't Starve Together because of the multiple circuits you can slot into him. This can either increase your health, sanity, hunger, movement speed, as well as the ability to see in the dark or be the light source itself. Despite his ability, WX78 can still be one of the more complex characters in this game as his advantages are followed up by disadvantages that could make the experience difficult for new players. He gets damaged by rain and his hunger and sanity is one of the lowest ones out there in his base form. Newbie friendliness, 2 out of 5. Wickerbottom is... Don't play Wickerbottom. Wickerbottom the Librarian is an amazing character and the right hands. However, the one thing that makes this character not as good for new players is her inability to sleep. Wickerbottom can't sleep. And don't ask me why, she just can't. So there goes your health and sanity regeneration through tents. What makes her an amazing character in the right hands is her ability to read books and cast spells. This extinguish flames, make it rain, grow plants, spawn tentacles, and even make people sleep. Albeit not for yourself. Great for experienced players, not as much for new ones. Newbie friendliness, 1 out of 5. Woody the Lumberjack is a fun and charming character. Definitely one of the most unique characters in the game. He's loud, he's proud, and he can turn into other things specifically weird things. His main gimmick is that he randomly transforms into other beasts come full moon. This can either be a were moose, a were goose, or a were beaver. He also gets advantages and disadvantages depending on the transformation, but my personal favorite thing about Woody is that he spawns in the world with his trusty axe, Lucy. She does not degrade or get destroyed during use basically giving you a permanent axe throughout the whole game. And god damn is she adorable! Newbie friendliness, 4 out of 5. Lucy's just too cute. We're halfway there and Wes the Silent used to be Don't Starve Together's hard mode character and, well, he still is. 
but Was has been through a lot of changes over the years, making his gameplay a little bit more interesting despite how difficult it can be. I'm just gonna say this right off the bat, newbie friendliness, 1 out of 5. Wes is more susceptible to overheating and freezing. He takes longer to gather materials when using tools. He does less damage when using weapons. Lightning strikes are more likely to smite him when it rains. And funnily enough, hounds will also prioritize attacks on Wes even when there are other players nearby. That's just mean. Pair this with his lower health, hunger, and sanity pool and... Yeah, maybe don't pick Wes. People generally pick Wes for the extra challenge, or to spice up their game. Maxwell the Puppet Master is able to summon shadow creatures to do his bidding. This ranges to both combat and material gathering, which is extremely useful. In fact, if you need someone that can gather multiple resources at once, it would be him. However, playing as Maxwell can get really complicated since the only way for you to summon shadow creatures is for you to use Nightmare Fuel. Nightmare Fuel is commonly gathered by defeating shadow creatures, and shadow creatures only appear when you're insane. And being insane, especially for new players, can be intimidating. There are other ways to get Nightmare Fuel, don't get me wrong, but due to Maxwell's necessity to know more about the game in order for him to be the best he can be, I'll rate his newbie friendliness a 2 out of 5. He's actually perfect when paired with Willow. If you like to fight enemies, then Wigfried, the performance artist, would be your best bet. Wigfried is specifically designed with combat in mind. She gains health and sanity when attacking enemies, and she's also able to provide buffs to fellow survivors as long as they are close enough. Wigfried is a tricky character for new players because, as useful as she is in combat, she, however, cannot, or rather will not, eat anything that is not meat and or candy. This means that the most common food found in the game, such as berries and carrots, won't be available to them. Despite this downside, however, if you can find a way to keep yourself alive and well-fed, then you'll have a much more enjoyable time playing the game. Newbie friendliness, 3 out of 5. Weber the Indigestible is my personal favorite character because of his ability, or rather gameplay, revolving around building spider dens and using them to survive the changing seasons. With Weber, you can build a spider army, able to keep yourself alive from hound attacks, cave enemies, and even some bosses. Because of Weber's monstrous appearance, pigs will try to attack him on sight, but in relation to this, spiders will actually see Weber as a friend. As an added bonus, Weber will also not receive damage from eating monster meat. Despite this, however, since spiders may be friendly towards you, they are still very much aggressive towards other survivors. You be friendly this, 3 out of 5. Now, the main gimmick about Winona the Handy Woman is that she can build contraptions and machines to help with survival and building the ultimate base, or building defensive mechanisms when necessary, albeit through catapults and generators. She can even build spotlights in the event that you've lost fire. And fun fact, there's not really a lot of disadvantages when playing as Winona other than the hunger cost for each contraption she makes, at least as far as I know. She provides more pros than cons, and for that reason, her newbie friendliness is a solid 5 out of 5. Warly the Culinarian is centered on preparing food in conjunction to the perks and buffs they provide. These can vary from lower temperature all the way to immunity to wetness. Each food has their own recipe and it'll make the game far more interesting as you explore the world and figure out all the recipes you can make. Or you can just Google it. He doesn't really make the game any easier for a new player, and if anything, he kinda makes it somewhat harder, forcing you to eat different types of food per meal, as Warly would refuse to eat the same thing twice. Within a set time, newbie fulliness, 1 out of 5. Next to my Weber, my second favorite character would be Walter the Fearless. He excels in three things ranged combat, exploration, and early gathering. Able to use a slingshot, he is the only character in Don't Starve Together that is able to do combat solely at a distance. He can craft slow down rounds, freeze rounds, cursed rounds, and even poop rounds. Walter also spawns in the game with his pet Wobby, for which you can use for item storage, and as a freaking mount. Suffice it to say, he's an awesome character 
just get him away from these. Newbie friendliness, 4 out of 5. He's a bit of a glass cannon, he loses both sanity and health when hit, so play him with a friend. Okay, there are 4 more survivors in Don't Starve Together that you can play, but you'll have to purchase them separately. These are Wand of the Time Keeper, Worth Talks the Soul Starve, Wormwood the Lonesome, and Worth the Half Pint. Sadly, I've never bought any of the DLC characters, and as such, I won't be able to provide you any guides on how they play, as, well, I've never played them, so. So if any of you know in the audience, please leave them in the comment section below. I'd highly appreciate it. The controls of this game can be a bit off, especially if you're new. I'm sure you've already experienced accidentally burning down the whole forest simply because you didn't know it was going to do that. Or worse, your base. So here are the controls. I'm sure you already knew this as most games use the same old standard layout for everything. But let's assume that you don't. WASD for moving, left click to use an item or attack, right click to interact, space to gather and pick up things, and F to attack the nearest possible enemy. Don't Starve Together does not have a weight system in terms of how many things you have on your inventory, so as long as you have space for it, you'll be fine. Try to craft a backpack as soon as possible or as you start exploring as you cannot believe how fast you can run out of inventory space in this game. Running on the roads makes you move faster. There's a very good chance that you already knew this, but there you go. Let's assume that you've been exploring for a while and at some point you will see one of these. These are called wormholes and as scary as those looks, these are mostly teleportation portals allowing you to move from one place to another. They're completely safe, but using one does cause a tiny bit of sanity loss. Once every season, there will be a full moon. During this time, certain things in the world will start to shift and change. My advice? Stay away from pigs. If you're playing as Woody, have fun. Don't explore the caves unless you're absolutely sure you're up for the challenge. I can't give you too many tips on caves, but that's mostly because even I'm having troubles with it. To enter the cave system, you will have to go through sinkholes. Now, you will have to mine them first to gain access to it, but take note that once opened, you can't plug them back in. Basilisks spawn out of sinkholes during dusk and will remain near the area until the next day. They are very annoying and will make the world much more dangerous than it already is. While the world does look like an island, you can actually set sail and find other islands depending on how the world is made and what mods you have. Seafaring is extremely fun, but much like the rest of the game, it can get really weird. And it has its own challenges. Be careful and keep your eyes open. This is my main tip when it comes to exploring. The world is just so alive and weird that you should always expect the unexpected. Combat in Don't Starve Together is very simple, but it can still be very tricky at times, especially if you don't know how the game treats combat. Oddly enough, it works the same way as Dark Souls, with each enemy having its own set of attack patterns, albeit much more simple. Again, as I've said before, I'm not gonna teach you what attack pattern every enemy has. I'm sure you can figure that out all by yourself. But most of the weaker enemies are just two attacks and then dodging for the third. Chopping too many trees will spawn tree guards. They are very strong and can one hit you to oblivion. Luckily, they have one of the easiest cutting patterns in Don't Starve Together. And all you need to do is to hit them twice, dodge, hit them twice again, and repeat until they ultimately die. This is also the easiest ways to practice kiting as they are one of, if not the easiest enemies to defeat, despite how much damage they do. A good mod to have installed to help learn Don't Starve Together's combat is display enemy range. And it does exactly as it's named. Okay, you don't necessarily have to defeat any of the bosses in this game, if you're not ready. In fact, every single boss enemy in this game is ignorable and optional. That includes the Deer Clops, which is the first boss most players usually encounter. Once your sanity goes low enough, shadow creatures will start to appear in your vision. Other players can see this, but only you will be the one who can interact with them. And by interact, I mean engage. 
A way to have your sanity back up is for you to either sleep, as I mentioned before, pick flowers, or you can defeat each one of them until your sanity goes up for each kill. Crafting is when most people start to have trouble, other than the fact that there is no damn tutorial in this game. Which is fine, but to help with that, here are some of the common things I usually craft in the first few days. Some components for specific items can only be found on certain seasons. Ice, for example, can only be found between the end of autumn and the start of spring. If you're having a hard time finding gears, you can now find them at the scrapyard, which was recently added to the game. You can also dig them up inside graves and tumbleweeds. I recommend the latter. Don't build your base next to ponds, especially ponds that look like this. Ponds are beneficial, but you don't want frogs getting too close to your base as they can turn aggressive to the player. There's actually another reason why you'd like to avoid these kinds of ponds, but you just have to trust me on this. It's actually possible to build a base in caves and you are also not limited to building just one base. In fact, some players create multiple ones. I don't, but you know, you do you. Alright, if you did go through the berry bush route for your garden, you will encounter a problem with gobblers spawning from the berries you've made, potentially eating up everything else. A quick way to solve this is to create a fenced up space with some sort of fruit in the middle of it. It will attract nearby gobblers, making them vulnerable to killing. It'll also give you meat as well. There are four seasons in Don't Starve Together. Autumn, Winter, Spring, and Summer. Now, I've already given you my thoughts on Autumn, which is the easiest of all seasons, mostly because nothing really happens during that time. But then comes the other seasons, and to be honest, this is where things start to get very weird, interesting, and fun. Mostly weird. Originally, I was going to explain this the same way I explained Autumn, but now that I've thought about it, that would just take away the charm and fun of the game. So instead, I'll give you some basic tips on how to survive each one. Winter is cold. Craft a touchstone, heat it up near a fire, and have it on your inventory. You'll stay warm for as long as the touchstone stays warm as well. Spring is wet. Craft an umbrella and build a lightning rod. The umbrella is for rain and the lightning rod is to prevent unwanted lightning strikes. Summer is hot. Craft the touchstone again and build an endothermic fire pit. It's like a normal fire pit, but cold. It's not my description, that's actually how the game describes it. Each season affects the world in multiple ways, most of them being significant enough to make it game-changing and far more interesting. Quick example being, winter makes it so that daytimes are shorter, ponds freeze up, and crops stop growing. So make sure you stock up on food. The bright side in this is that food spoilage would actually slow down and specific materials normally found in other seasons do start to appear as well. For example, ice, tusks, and certain types of birds. And that's it. Don't Starve Together is one of the most replayable survival games I've ever played, and with there being massive amounts of content drops and updates, it will take a while before you can experience everything the game has to offer. I mean, even I myself never scratched the surface of this game, and that is not including the mods that is available right now. Play it with your friends, install some mods, you can even play as your favorite VTubers if you'd like. The modding community in this game is just so damn good, and it's very impressive. Hey everyone, it's been a while. Sorry about the absence lately, got a job, tried to be promoted, failed, tried again, but you know, my mental health was dying, so that was fun, but I'm good now. Ish. So expect some more uploads in the near future. In fact, I've just recorded another one as we speak, and I'm currently writing the script for that one as well. Now, I've had a lot of comments saying that I should do a Don't Starve Together video, and here it is. It took longer than I thought it would. I wasn't expecting a 45 minute video, so I'm thinking of trimming down the next video as I don't want it to take that long. But I hope you enjoy it. If you want to see more, click on this video where I made a beginner's guide for the forest, which is kind of like Don't Starve Together, but not really. I don't know why I compared the two. Anyways. Bye! I should really work on how I end these videos. Subscribe!